I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. And we are two Shakespeare nerds who decided to make a podcast about our love for Shakespeare. In this podcast, we will tackle as many dimensions to Shakespeare's plays as we can by looking at the text, examining the historical context in which it was written, and how the text is viewed through modern lenses of feminism, racism, classism, colonialism, nationalism, ableism, all of the isms. We will discuss how his plays shaped both the past and present, and, as actors, how his plays can be responsibly performed today, all while trying our best to approach his works without giving in to bardolatry. So, Shakespeare anyone? Hi listeners, it's Courtney here. If you are listening to this episode after 2023, you might be wondering, who is this Corey Lee Smith host? When we started this podcast, I went by that stage name, Corey. I've chosen to leave my stage name, and, as you know, I now go by Courtney. But before you enjoy past Elise and past Courtney's episodes in our back catalog, I wanted to clarify the name switch. Now that I've set that straight, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Hello, listeners. This is Courtney. Elise and I are so thrilled to continue bringing episodes of Shakespeare Anyone to listeners like you for free. We do this out of our love for Shakespeare, theater making, scholarship, and decentering dead white men. We put a lot of hard work into research, recording, editing, and generally producing a podcast. With that said, I'm here to remind you all that we have a Patreon page if you want to support our current work and our future goals that we believe Patreon will help us achieve. We've created a variety of support levels and continue to create exclusive bonus content for our patrons on a monthly basis. Our bonus content so far includes Shakespeare Stuff We Loved This Month posts, where we share the Shakespeare-related products we are obsessing over. Not only that, but we already launched bonus episodes. One is an extension on our conversation with Dr. Simone Chess about John Lilly's Galatea and Early Modern Trans Studies. And the second is a conversation with special guest Stephanie from Protest Too Much Podcast, in which we review Joel Cohen's Macbeth starring Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. Elise and I also discuss Shakespeare-adjacent content, like movies, TV shows, books, to name a few, and share those conversations exclusively to Patreon. These are incredible conversations you can unlock as a patron. We also have plans for additional bonus episodes, including more special guests, more film reviews, and even an Ask Us Anything. Distinguished patrons even receive exclusive voting power and snail mail. If you would like to join us and support the production of this podcast, or just check out the Shakespeare-themed names we've given the support levels, head to patreon.com slash shakespeareanyone. The link will also be in our episode descriptions. And if you like what you hear, Elise and I would greatly appreciate it if you could rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Your review might even make it on an episode. When you're done, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and then tell a friend. Word of mouth is our best form of advertisement. Thank you for listening and all of the support you give us and the podcast. Now, on to the episode. Welcome to another Shakespeare Anyone mini-episode. In these mini-episodes, we'll be exploring topics that are related to Shakespeare but aren't necessarily connected to whatever play we've been discussing. And they're mini because, well, they're shorter than our other episodes. They're like quartos if the regular episodes are folio editions. In today's episode, we'll be covering cross-dressing in early modern England. Shakespeare depicts cross-dressing in many plays, but what was the contemporary cultural context? But before we get started, we think it would be wise to create a glossary for listeners who maybe aren't so familiar with the language of the LGBTQIA community, as well as antiquated terms from early modern England that we'll be bringing up. Let's dive in. The first term we want to define is cross-dressing. Cross-dressing is the act of wearing the clothes of the gender one does not identify with. While simple, this definition is incredibly limiting when looking at the human experience, 
as well as gender identity and gender expression, especially given the fact that gender and sex binaries are social constructs, gender lives on a spectrum, and there are more than two sexes. But for the sake of discussing Shakespeare and early modern England, we are going to do our best to balance the mentality of that time with what we know now. The next term we want to define is drag, or dressing in drag. Is cross-dressing drag? Yes and no. Drag is defined as the performance of masculinity and femininity. A drag queen is a person, typically identifying as male, who performs femininity. A drag king is a person who typically identifies as female, performing masculinity. And of course, there are performers who perform somewhere within this binary. Drag is performance. So, just because someone cross-dresses doesn't mean they perform in drag. Hence, cross-dressing is and is not drag. And, unlike Corey's factoid in the intro series, the term dressed resembling a girl in Shakespeare's scripts could not be confirmed from our research. While we never claimed the term drag was used during Shakespeare's time, it's suggested that the term originated from theater slang of the 19th century for long skirts trailing along the floor. The next term we want to define is transgender. Are cross-dressing peoples or peoples who perform drag the same as transgender peoples? No. According to GLAD's Media Reference Guide, transgender is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. People under this umbrella may describe themselves using one or more of a wide variety of terms. The key difference is that cross-dressing peoples present as a sex or gender that they do not identify with. Regardless of how visibly or not visibly transgender a person may be, their presentation rings true to their identity. The last term we want to define is transvestite, or transvestism. Transvestite and transvestism are antiquated terms that we do not encourage using unless a person asks to be referred to this way. This is due to its transformation from a blanket term for cross-dressers and cross-dressing associated with non-heterosexual behavior to a derogatory term that was a linguistic tool to oppress gay peoples. You'll be hearing a bit of this word in the episode due to its presence in the text of early modern England, Please keep in mind its historical context. And lastly, it's important to note, as scholar Jean E. Howard writes, there's no way to measure how many people cross-dressed in Renaissance or early modern England, or why. This is due to limited sources. We couldn't find any sources detailing first-hand accounts through primary sources like letters or diary entries. And even though we know queer and transgender people have always existed, we can only assume queer people might have cross-dressed as a form of gender expression. Unfortunately, we cannot cover the queer landscape in this episode. So instead, let's talk about those transgressors written down in history. And yes, cross-dressing during Shakespeare's time was a transgression against one's providentially determined rank in life. And this predetermined identity was enforced through strict sumptuary regulations put in place in England starting as early as the 12th century that went on into the 18th century. Sumptuary laws regulated consumption of luxury goods ranging from food to furniture to clothing. They restricted what clothing subjects were legally allowed to wear according to their rank in life. Men were supposed to dress like traditional English men. Women were supposed to dress like traditional English women. In addition to gender restrictions, there were class restrictions. Laws laid out the types of clothes, the colors worn, the fabrics used, and embellishments donned one could wear according to their social class. If you broke one of these laws, the justice of the peace could confiscate the article of clothing and you'd be fined. But hold on. Didn't Shakespeare use boy actors to play as female characters? Boys dressed as women, a.k.a. cross-dressers? How did cross-dressing, in spite of sumptuary laws, work its way into Shakespeare's theater? Well, the practice of cross-dressing in theater started well before Shakespeare's time. Many societies banned women from performing in professional theater, including the ancient Greek theater and the Japanese kabuki theater. Since the Elizabethan theater also excluded women actors from their professional stages, they turned to boy actors to play the roles of female characters. These cross-dressing actors were a widely accepted, though still controversial, theatrical convention at a time when no one else was legally allowed to dress and act outside of their station in life, according to the sumptuary laws. So, basically, 
the theaters of the day openly went against the law to satisfy a need for female characters. And all for good reason. I mean, professional acting is just so dangerous for women folk. Obviously, we're being sarcastic. Even though the patriarchy's strict gender roles were worse for women actors, life was no walk in the park for boy actors. Public discourse, especially of the Puritan nature, believed at the simplest form effeminate clothing made a man weak and tender, a jab at their, quote-unquote, manliness. At a more serious level, men wearing women's clothes were seen as so out of place that they became monstrous and a sexual perversion. A man, and especially a boy who theatricalizes as female, is said to invite playing the woman's part in sexual congress. In spite of this abusive rhetoric, boy actors continued to cross-dress in performance until the Puritans shut down English theaters in 1642. But boy actors were not the only recorded cross-dressers of the time. Women and men cross-dressed outside of the walls of a theater as well. Thomas Salmon was caught by authorities after borrowing and wearing women's clothes in order to participate in a woman's only celebration. And for the women who cross-dressed, the significance for them is usually generalized as a desire to pass as men to participate in life outside of the home. The first recorded instances of early modern women cross-dressing dates back to 1570 and it reaches a climax by 1620. Puritan pamphleteers and moralists of this era were not happy to see women dressing outside of their rank. Letter writer John Chamberlain wrote to his friend and Secretary of State, Dudley Carleton, first Viscount of Dorchester, that, quote, the world is very far out of order, unquote. The danger reached such heights and was so distressing that King James I had to intervene personally, ordering an Anglican priest to preach against these women. But alas, we don't know all that much about these women. But one thing we did learn is that historian R. Mark Benbow examined the records from Bridewell and the Alderman's Court during the years 1565 and 1605 and found that many of the women apprehended in men's clothing were accused of prostitution. This seems out of touch with more modern homophobic or transphobic fears of a cross-dressing woman. Dorothy Clayton, a spinster, was reported to, quote, Contrary to all honesty and womanhood, commonly go about the city apparelled in men's attire. She has abused her body with sundry persons and lived an incontinent or uncontrolled life. Unquote. But not all women were labeled sex workers by the court. Another woman, Joanna Goodman, was whipped and sent to Bridewell in 1569 for dressing as a male servant so she could accompany her soldier husband to war. Other records document that some women were in service or employed to lend in tavern keepers or tradesmen, some wore male clothing for protection traveling the city, and yes, some might have been sex workers. But, to be honest, these records don't tell us all that much about the women in question, aside from their crime. Regardless of their motivation, to early modern English society, their cross-dressing was a demonized sign that they were sexually available. This is because women of the time were viewed as creatures of strong sexual appetites needing strict regulation. According to the time, sexual desire indicates both women's inferiority as well as the justification for her control by men. Women who took men's clothes had symbolically left their proper subordinate positions and became masterless women, a threat to society. This fear was so great that pamphleteers got creative, as well as offensive, when writing against cross-dressing. For example, Pick Mullier, an anonymous pamphlet published in 1620, condemned transvestism in response to women wearing men's apparel. The socially conservative pamphleteer and other social conservative objectors argued that transvestism is an affront to nature, the Bible, the great chain of being, and society. The author writes, quote, If this cross-dressing be not barbarous, make the rude Scythian, the untamed Moor, the naked Indian, or the wild Irish lords and rulers of well-governed cities." Unquote. This author is sexist and also racist and prejudiced. But not everyone in early modern England opposed cross-dressing. Shortly after, another pamphlet, Hake Veer, countered Hake Mullier's arguments. Hake Veer defended these women who did not fit into their expected gender role. Unlike the straightforward, single-viewpoint delivery of Hake Mullier, Hake Veer is a dialogue between two people, Hick Moulier, translated to the man-woman or the female transvestite, and Hake Veer, 
translated to the womanish man, or the male transvestite. Some scholars identified this pamphlet as an early form of feminism in Renaissance England. It criticizes the gender hierarchy by declaring it is not nature, but custom, that dictates women's dress and place in society. It also states, quote, custom is an idiot, unquote. The naturalness of the whole gender system seems to be in question, but this pamphlet also argues that women are overstepping their bounds in their gender identity because men have ceased to be real men. This toxic view was a real fear during Jacobean England. Apparently, men were softer during James's reign than when Elizabeth was queen. Now, let's bring it back to Shakespeare. He wrote a handful of plays that were heavily concerned with cross-dressing as a primary component to the plot. Those plays are Twelfth Night, The Merchant of Venice, and As You Like It. First, let's talk about Viola from Twelfth Night, who cross-dresses as Cesario after being shipwrecked onto the shores of Illyria. While modern scholars like to look for a political act or a transgender identity in Viola's cross-dressing, it should be noted that Viola seems to use cross-dressing as more of a haven, allowing her the freedom to survive in an alien environment and as a magical means of keeping alive her brother, whom she assumes has drowned in the wreck. It's also important to note she is the only one of Shakespeare's cross-dressing females who questions the morality of her transgression. Any undertones from our modern eye should probably be disregarded because she navigates the entire play wanting to be rid of her male appearance and return to her quote-unquote acceptable femininity. But not all of Shakespeare's cross-dressing plays are quite so safe, for lack of a better word. Portia from The Merchant of Venice engages in much more disruptive cross-dressing than Viola. Battling with the power of her dead father's control over her, she adopts male dress in order to enter the masculine arena of the courtroom and advocate for herself. Her cross-dressing, like Viola's, is not an indication of identity. It's a vehicle for power. And Portia's role, as a woman who can successfully hold her own in a man's role, seems to dismantle the sex-gender system and argue, like Hake Veer, that man's part is based on custom, not nature. Where these two representations of accepting versus challenging the gender binary seem to converge is in the character of Rosalind from As You Like It. While Rosalind does spend the entire play longing to return to her female-presenting identity, she does expose the construct of the gender system through her masquerading as Rosalind, dressed as boy Ganymede, playing a female called Rosalind for Orlando, thus acting out the parts scripted for men and women by her culture. It's interesting to note that Shakespeare's cross-dressing plays focus on heterosexual romance, as well as the strict masculine and feminine differences of the two-gender and two-sex system, all while boy actors play female characters opposite other male actors. For whatever reason, Shakespeare's audiences must have been able to suspend their disbelief, or the plays themselves must not have bothered a majority of theatergoers. When Henry Jackson saw the King's Men perform Othello at Oxford in 1610, he wrote of Desdemona in his diary, quote, She always acted the matter very well. In her death moved us still more greatly, when lying in bed she implored the pity of those watching with her countenance alone. Unquote. That Jackson referred to the boy actor as she, when he certainly knew better rationally, may in itself testify to the strength of the illusion. Some of Shakespeare's female characters even outright mention their deception in the text. Rosalind reminds the audience in the epilogue that she is a boy. The page in the induction to The Taming of the Shrew deliberately calls attention to the fact that boy actors are playing the, quote, grace, voice, gait, and action of all of the gentlewomen. And all the while, at the end of these plays, all the female characters return to their female identity with their appropriate heterosexual partner, reinforcing the status quo. Now, society at large likes to praise Shakespeare and his works for many reasons. But... Unfortunately, from what we've learned, his cross-dressing plays seem to lean towards accepting the gender systems at large, and like we said, reinforcing the status quo. And he's not the only playwright to do that. Many plays of the time, like contemporary Ben Jonson's Epicene, also lean towards this conclusion. However, there is one notable play of early modern England that straight up challenges the gender system, and that play is Thomas Middleton and Thomas Decker's the Roaring Girl. The Roaring Girl follows Moll, a cross-dressing woman who disguises herself in male clothes in order to assert her own freedom from the traditional positions of a woman in her culture. She tells the play's young hero, quote, 
I have the head now of myself, and am man enough for a woman. Marriage is but a chopping and changing, where a maiden loses one head and has a worse in the place. Unquote. In addition to not needing no man, she also calls out the social realities that create conditions for sex work, and she challenges the assumptions made by men about women. These assumptions were the ones that landed so many cross-dressing women before the alderman's court for quote-unquote lewd behavior. The play also ends with Maul delivering a prophetic speech of utopian social reform for women. All of this wrapped into a play that is thought to have premiered sometime between 1607 and 1610, near the end of Shakespeare's career. And, to wrap this all up, it's fascinating that Shakespeare's all-male theater company performed these cross-dressing plays for the very women whose enhanced freedom, one could argue, was perceived as a threat to the patriarchal order. Shakespeare's theater may be a crossroads between cultural change and contradiction, where the women viewing his plays were much more radical than his fictional women on stage. And that's cross-dressing in early modern England. Thank you for listening to this episode. I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. This is Shakespeare Anyone? Thank you so much for listening to Shakespeare Anyone. Works referenced in this episode are available in the episode description. Our theme music is Never Ending Minute by Sounds Like Sander. If you would like to support us, it would help us out if you would hit the subscribe button, like us, leave a comment, write a review, share us on social media, tell a friend about us, all the things. We'd appreciate it. You can also support the podcast at patreon.com slash Shakespeare Anyone. Patreon patrons get access to exclusive bonus content throughout the year. The link is also in the episode description. For more, you can visit our website, shakespeareanyone.com, follow us on Instagram at shakespeareanyonepod, or Twitter at shakespeareanyone. For Twitter, that's Shakespeare any and the number one. Every other platform is spelled out like the name of the podcast. Now, because you listened all the way to the end of the credits, here's a completely random Shakespeare quote for you. From Troilus and Cressida, Act 1, Scene 2, said by Pandrus. You are such another.